You're listening to The Bible Revealed, a podcast empowering you to understand the Bible and transform your faith. If you've ever felt intimidated or unsure about reading your Bible, then this show is for you. So get ready to be encouraged, equipped, and strengthened in your faith. And now, here's your host, Pastor Phil Ayers. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Phil Ayers, and the goal of this podcast is to connect you to God in a real way. And the method that I like to use to help connect you to God is by helping you understand more about the Scriptures. See, a lot of people say, well, what's, you know, what's so important about the Bible? What does that have to do with my spiritual life? Well, God has revealed Himself to us through the Scriptures, through the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so the more we understand about the Scriptures or the more comfortable we get with the Scriptures, I believe the more we come to know who God is and that will allow us to grow closer to Him. And so that's what this podcast is all about. On the show today, we're going to go right straight to the good stuff. I had an opportunity to interview Sarah Robinson. She's a young writer out of Nashville, Tennessee. She writes on the topic... Uh, well, she writes on spiritual spiritual topics, but specifically, or at least recently, specifically about dealing with depression and anxiety in the church. And we'll share a little bit about it, but she wrote a blog post that went viral. Uh, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people read it. I think the title of the blog post was, I, I Love Jesus, But I Still Want to Die. She's somebody who has dealt with depression Uh, She's a strong Christian, but she's dealt with some of those issues that, for whatever reason, we don't seem to talk about in the church very much. When I spoke with her, I asked if we could talk about this topic and look at what the Bible, how the Bible deals with the topic, specifically by understanding some of the people who were in the Scriptures who also faced depression and anxiety. And so that's what we did. So glad to have her on the show. Make sure that you listen. Stay tuned all the way to the end because there are some important links that she shares Uh, about how to deal with some of these topics yourself or if you have friends that are dealing with depression. So without any further ado, here is my interview recorded a couple weeks ago with Sarah Robinson. Enjoy. So on the phone with me now is Sarah Robinson. She's a writer. She lives in Nashville, somebody that I've known on the Internet for a little while, reading her blog, and uh, she's also a member of a group that I'm in called the Tribe Writers. But we had a chance to meet in person. I saw her speak at the latest Tribe Conference. She did an awesome job, and I'm so excited to have you on the podcast today, Sarah. Thanks for being with us. Well, thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. You know, your topic, what you write about, uh, well, you write about a lot of things, but the the topic that you seem to cover or specialize in is this idea of Christians who struggle, well, maybe not just Christians, but people who are spiritual and struggle with depression, anxiety, and even suicide. How did you get started writing about that? Well, um, I always have had this passion to kind of make the way easier for other people than it was for me. And I struggled with depression and have struggled. I continue to um, deal with depression and anxiety um, really my whole life. I don't remember a time before I was depressed. I remember having thoughts of suicide really as an elementary school child Um, I became a Christian when I was in high school and the church I became a Christian in and and joined was really wonderful in a lot of ways and also had some what I would call unhealthy theology in some particular areas and areas that I think are fairly common Um, ideas that if you're a good person and you read your Bible and you pray and you witness and do all of these things that your life's going to be really good. God's going to heal you. God's going to bless you financially so that you can be a blessing to others. All of those kind of um, subtle prosperity, name it and claim it gospel kind of things were kind of woven throughout our community. And so there wasn't a lot of room for people struggling and suffering. There was this idea that it was 
demonic. It was a lack of faith. It was because you had some hidden sin. And it took a lot of years for me to really realize, hey, this is a health issue. Yes, there are spiritual aspects to it, but ultimately this is a medical situation you're dealing with and it needs to be treated like other illnesses. And so Um, From that point on, I would sort of talk to people one-on-one personally and kind of share what I was learning. Um, I was in youth ministry for about 10 years, and I worked also at a residential facility for young women with mental health issues, unplanned pregnancies, addictions, things like that. And so I had a lot of one-on-one experience talking to people about this. But then about a year ago, uh, a little over a year ago, Anthony Bourdain and Kate Spade both died of suicide within just a couple weeks. And I'd written a bit about struggles with depression and anxiety and um, previous struggles with self-harm, but I just found myself so angry when they passed away because I kind of knew what was coming. Um, Having been in the church long enough, I knew that there were going to be some people who responded really well and recognized this was a tragedy and these people probably died from a really horrible disease called depression or some other mental illness. But I also knew that there were going to be some really ugly things said and people were going to say things like, oh, well, you know, it's just because they weren't Christians or what a selfish thing or, um, you know, if they just prayed and read Bibles, they would be fine that, you know, people serving God don't struggle like that. And, you know, you just need to choose joy, stop thinking about it, quit being so selfish, all of those things. And I just found myself so frustrated and angry that I just kind of had to write Um, this blog post. And so I wrote this article last summer called I Love Jesus, But I Want to Die, What You Need to Know About Suicide. And I was shocked at the response. I thought, you know, maybe a few more people would read it than normally read my blog. But um, it really hit a nerve with people. And that was a moment when I realized that there was such a great need for this. And I realized that not a lot of people were talking about it as openly as I had in that article. And so, you know, for lack of a better or less spiritual term or whatever, I just really kind of felt like this was a call, not necessarily a call I wanted, you know, like who wants to be the suicide girl, Um, but it, it just really spoke to people. And so let's talk about that post for a second, because I think the, the, I remember, uh, Jeff, who's the sort of the head of the tribe writers, founder of tribe Mm -hmm. writers said, you know, it went viral and it did. Um, how many talk about for a second about, because you say touch to nerve, how many people read that? post if you have the numbers and how many people then, you know, responded or reacted? Because I know it got posted on maybe relevant to, or maybe Mm -hmm. there was a backlink back to your blog. Yeah. So, um, I have a friend who's like relational genius and he just knows like everybody. And he was like, you need to send this to relevant. And, um, This was before a lot of the issues with Relevant magazine that have come out over the past month or so um, (laughs) really kind of broke. Sure. And so, um, you know, I wasn't aware of all of the issues with Relevant. But at that time, my friend sent the article over to um, actually to Andre Henry, who was the um, editor at the time and was like, hey, you know do you think you should publish this? And Andre emailed me back and was like, yes, we'd love to share this. Um, which was a huge honor I felt. And, um, 
So they published that either the day before, like within just a couple of days of it going live on my site. Um, and then they've re, uh, published it about every six months. Um, I don't have the numbers for relevant, but I know that they get a much wider reach than my site. Um, my site, there've been over 400,000 people who've read it on my blog. Um, and then knowing that relevant has a much wider reach than my site and, um, that it's been published on several other sites with a fairly large reach. My best estimate is that probably more than a million people have seen it. Wow. Um, which is crazy. Absolutely insane. Well, I love what you said about a call and, and, um, you know, I think you wanted to qualify that a little bit. I, I know that you're uh, a humble person. But I do believe that um, this is a definite need in society, but especially in the church. Totally. It's as if we're not allowed to talk about uh, being depressed or dealing with anxiety when it's all over the Bible. This is You, you mentioned, you know, the church you sort of grew up in. Uh, theology uh, that was like a subtle prosperity sort of theology. I call it the cause and effect theology, and it's hard. <laughs> it's like it's hard to pull ourselves out of it because our whole life we're raised that way, right? I mean, if you do totally. something good when you're a child, you get a reward. If you do something bad, you know, there's a punishment. That's the way it is in school. That's the way it is in college. It's the way it is in the workplace. So you think, oh, that's the way it is with God. If I'm struggling, I must be doing something wrong. Except... Yeah. Um, I am countless, countless characters in the Bible struggled. I, sometimes I've even challenged people. I go, you point out one truly happy character in the Bible, like truly happy. <laughs> and it's kind of hard. But who are some of the characters in the Bible that resonate with you in terms of, you know, depression, anxiety and, and struggling um, with mental health issues? Yeah. Um, man, that cause and effect thing that you said is so good. I was actually just reading this morning um, in Ecclesiastes that um, there's this verse I've literally never heard anybody preach on mm. or even mention. And I came across it one day and I was like, why aren't people talking about this? Um, it's Ecclesiastes 9:11, And it says, again, I saw that under the sun, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor the bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. Mm. And um, what the author is saying is that this cause and effect thing isn't real life. The fastest people don't always win the race. The yeah. smartest people don't always get the money. Um, those who are wise don't always get the favor and the accolades, but time and chance just happens to us. Mm. Um, and I think that is something that is really kind of selectively edited from the Bible in some of our theologies. Sure. There's tons of people who struggle. I mean, for many different reasons, you look at Jeremiah, he's known as the weeping prophet. Um, he definitely had some pretty severe emotional challenges, but if you look at the trauma he endured, um, watching the people he loved being slaughtered and enduring the siege um, of Babylon on Jerusalem. And, um, you know, that, that was so bad that at times people were eating their own children because they were starving and their kids had, you know, passed away. Like that's traumatic. That's right. some serious PTSD, some serious depression and issues. Um, you know, Job was going through really horrendous grief and, he wished several times that he'd never been born yeah. and cursed the day he'd come from the womb. People often, you know, when it comes to Job, we're good at preaching the first three chapters. And there's 36 or 37 more chapters of him, yeah. you know, really dealing with his emotional trauma. Um, sorry, you said David. Of course, David seemed yeah. to be, um, you know, at, at times very depressed or dealing with yeah. um, thoughts. C continue. Yeah, totally. I mean, he had his father-in-law try to kill him. He was rejected by his entire family, so much so that they didn't even take ownership of him as a son when Samuel came to anoint the next king mm. and told Jesse, like, hey, call all your sons. Like, 
David was so rejected that he wasn't even invited. Um, that's, you know, pretty significant stuff to deal with throughout your life. And we like to look at these stories of like, oh, he killed Goliath and all this right. stuff. But um, yeah, he dealt with a lot. Um, but one of my favorite stories is um, the story of Elisha. And again, this is a, another one that's pretty often overlooked. Um, but, you know, we are very familiar, especially if we went to Sunday school and saw it on the flannel graph and all that, like the showdown on Mount Carmel where the prophets of Baal are, you know, dancing around and like they can't call fire down, but then Elijah does and God answers by fire and consumes the sacrifice. So this crazy thing happens. And then the very next day, um, in first Kings 19, it talks about how, um, King Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how all the prophets of Baal had been put to death. And then Jezebel sends a message to Elijah and says, may the gods strike me dead. If by this time tomorrow, I don't do the same thing to you that you did to the prophets. So his life has been threatened. Um, so he's afraid he runs for his life and, um, then, you know, he runs, leaves his servant there, walks another day into the wilderness. He stops and sits down in the shade of the tree. This is First um, Kings chapter 19, verse 4, and wishes he could die. Right. It's too much, Lord. He prayed, take away my life. I might as well be dead. And we have some sort of rote responses Um, I almost think of like the canned responses you can set up in Gmail. When someone says something like that, you're supposed to say like, choose joy. And, you know, like, but Jesus died for you and all this stuff. Right. The simple things. Yeah. Yeah. That's not how God responds. Right. God gives him, God takes care of his natural needs. Right. He lets him know he's not alone. And then he speaks to the lies Elijah is believing. So Elijah lays down under the tree, falls asleep. Then an angel comes and wakes him up and says, hey, wake up and eat. There's a fresh baked loaf of bread and a jar of water. So he eats and drinks and lays down again. Um, The angel comes and wakes him up a second time and says, get up and eat or the trip will be too much for you. So he gets up, eats and drinks, and he has enough strength from taking care of those natural needs to walk onto the holy mountain. So then he goes into this cave to spend the night and the Lord speaks to him. What are you doing here? And, you know, he says, God, I've always served you. I've served you alone, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars and killed all your prophets. And I'm the only one left and they're trying to kill me. And so, you know, he comes to the Lord honestly with these, these things he's believing and there's a lot of truth in them, but there's some stuff that's not true as well. And then the story goes on and God reveals himself to Elijah. There's the big whirlwind and the fire and God's not in the whirlwind. He's not in the fire, but he's in the still small voice. Um, And in that quiet place without showing a lot of, you know, power, God reveals himself to be there in like that quiet, broken place with Elijah. And then after, you know, Elijah's fed and rested and has gotten through like that crisis moment and he knows he's not alone, then God says, you're not alone. Not only am I with you, but there's still a lot of prophets left who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And so I think that's just such a beautiful picture of one, God's heart towards us, but two, what our heart should be towards each other. If someone says, I'm struggling, I wish I was never born, I wish I could die. We need to understand that there's a lot more going on than just them not having a right perspective. There's some probably some natural things going on, whether they're burnt out, whether they're um, dealing with some chemical imbalances, whether they need medication, whether they need therapy, those natural things need to be taken care of. They need to know they're not alone and they need to know um, once those things are taken care of, then you can start to address some of the lies that 
you're believing because you feel safe and you feel loved. There's so much. I mean, well, first of all, it takes a lot of guts for somebody to admit that they're struggling with, Mm -hmm. you know, with negative feelings in the church, because I think they are worried they're going to be chastised or they're going to get, you know, some um, uh, encouragement, you know, like. Uh, what I call like at a meme level encouragement, you know, like the choose joy, you know, it's like <laughs> yeah. simple answer. I've actually and this is uh, this has happened in my church in the last, I'd say, month. I've had two occasions where somebody was essentially shamed for not having enough faith, which was really mm-hmm. damaging. If you think about it. like if you had enough totally. faith, you wouldn't be dealing with that, which is, I think, why people don't don't share this. That's why they don't talk about it. Um, right. The good news is I do believe just at culture at large is beginning to accept the concept or accept the idea that, um, you know, that people are dealing with struggles and sometimes very, well, seemingly very capable people. Like if you think about Elijah, yeah. I love how you link those two stories because a lot of times we'll either preach about the prophets of Baal or we'll preach about the still small voice, but we don't recognize that those events are linked like he was up on the mountain you know Mm -hmm. heroically battling um for god and was vindicated with this fire that came down from the sky and then in the very next moment he wants to die and it 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 reminds me of a lot of um ministry people yeah um specifically obviously recently jared wilson who was a very very gifted young um uh, pastor Mm -hmm. and and you can see him he's you know, he's battling it out like Elijah when it comes to preaching. He's very gifted, but then deep down inside, he's struggling. And so what are the things I think that we can, what are the things we can do in the church to either, uh, well, I would say to to feel free to share what we're going through and then to ex, to uh, respond to things that are pe- people are going through. Like, do you have any, any helpful ideas on how we can uh, do that better? Yeah, I think, I mean, the big thing is we have to start talking about it. And there are more conversations happening. Um, You know, Jared is kind of on the top of everyone's mind because that was more recent. Sure. Um, Last year, there was Andrew Steckline. Um, There have been several other pastors over the past several years. And it's heartbreaking. It really is. But it reminds me that even if you're in leadership and even if you're an advocate as Andrew and Jared were, and you talk about getting help and you know all the right things to do, the pressure to be telling your story from a place of victory can be so intense. And so I think we've come to a place where we're more open to saying, I had depression. I have struggled with this. I have been suicidal. Um, And you can even see that in, you know, some articles that Jared published, for example, he talked about like, I have been suicidal. Oh, I see. You're Um, saying it's, it's easy to talk about it as if it's in past tense. Right, because God has given you the victory. Right, right. Um, but it's not uh, its not as inspiring to come up and say, look, I'm right in the middle of this right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah you don't, you know, people don't really understand what a victory it is to right. say, I got out of bed today sometimes. Or yes. um, I chose to tell somebody that I was having some intrusive thoughts of suicide or right. um I went to a doctor and got on medication. Those are stories of victory too. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. They're not, they're not the, they don't come in the wrapping paper we want. And so um, I think the biggest thing is to become more comfortable with being uncomfortable to make room to not have answers. I think that's, that's one of the biggest things that has really cursed the evangelical church, particularly in America, is this addiction to having answers and certainty Mm. when we're called to follow someone who, you know, died and rose again. Yes. We know the end of the story, 
but he also is like, Hey, you're going to have trouble in this life. You know, things are not always going to be easy. I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword and all of these things. Like he did not promise certainty. He did not promise answers. He promised to be with us. And we do have certainty that he is with us and that he is good and that he will work everything out to our good. But beyond that, you know, we don't have any certainty about what today right. or tomorrow or the next day is going to bring. There's sort we of uh, no guarantees. Um, yeah. Uh, but the guarantee is that that Christ walks through these things with you, maybe gives you the totally. strength and perseverance. Um, as, but, but I knew, you know, I, I know that God also allows this suffering into our life for a reason. I think this is yeah. one of the things, and you brought this up, um, earlier when we were, um, getting ready for this interview that it, it's like, um, um, there's all these Bible passages about our suffering and about remaining humble and about being yeah. weak. And then somehow we don't aspire to that and if you're if you're a person who struggled with depression and anxiety i'm somebody who currently takes medication for anxiety that's mm. a problem that i've had i wrote about it in my blog a little while ago um it's an ongoing thing for me it's a weakness yeah but i recognize or i have to recognize that god allows that weakness for a reason and one of those things is uh, i have to depend on him share a little bit about um you know, how you relate to that. How do we maybe as a church um, explore this idea of God's presence within our own suffering? I think that is, I mean, that's my favorite thing about God. Um, I was talking to a friend yesterday and she's like, my favorite Jesus is the Jesus who turned over the tables in the temple and like <laughs> took the time to like, you know, weave a whip together to like drive all the animals out. And she's like, that's my favorite Jesus. Get him, Jesus. And she's Southern. So she said it about like that. Um, but my favorite, I mean, obviously he's one cohesive person, you know, Jesus, but my favorite thing about him is that he is with us. Mm. And I was, I was, I got an email from a reader this morning. She's like, I just don't understand how come if God doesn't give people more than they can handle, why are there so many people in mental hospitals? Um, and the thing is, that's not scriptural I at know. all. Like that verse is not in the Bible. The closest thing to it is um, in 1 Corinthians 10, where right. it talks about God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what your ability is. And he'll allow, oh, he'll provide a way of escape so that you can endure the temptation. Right. He's talking about sin and how God has made a way for us to get out of tempting opportunities to sin. Yes. Um, well, quite the opposite is true because I just had this conversation with somebody who, you know, believe that God will not give you more than you're able to to handle. But uh, Paul writes in Second Corinthians, he says, we don't want you to be uninformed about the troubles we experience. We are under great mm -hmm. pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired yeah. of life itself. The Yeah. I mean— there's well that goes back to sort of the the bad theology but so yeah. anyway you were chatting with or you were uh, responding to an email that you received yeah and you know i just kind of talked to her about that i i was asking for feedback of what to include in the book i'm working on and um that was something that she she said she's like i just don't understand this and so you know i emailed her back and was like hey like that's actually one of those phrases people make up like mm -hmm. cleanliness is next to godliness yes, yes. or like God helps those who help themselves. Right. Like that's not scriptural. Um, but to me, like the way that I have really connected with God the most is through knowing that he's with me no matter what. Mm. And in the dark places of mental illness, there's a lot of, conflicting emotions. It's not just sadness. There's anger and there's numbness and there's grief and there's just a lot of confusion and fear. And there have been times where I was so angry at God. I told him I'd slap him if he'd ever show his face. Mm. 
um, and I, I'd cuss him out and be like, what's wrong with you? Why won't you just wave your little magic wand that you have up there somewhere and fix me? Because I know you can. Um, but in the midst of that, I came across this verse in Psalm 139. Again, it's, you know, not the common one, like you knit me together in mm-hmm. my mother's womb. Um, so this verse says, if I make my bed in the pit of hell, you'll be there, right? You'll be right there with me. And I just think that's so powerful because in the darkness and in the depths, God is present with us. And, you know, especially in the Psalms, this entire book is full of the full breadth of human emotions, the depression and the joy and the sorrow and the anger. And right there in the midst of it, kind of tucked away into this Psalm that we think about like, oh, like you knit me together in my mother's womb and all that. Mm -hmm. It's, I can go down to the pit of hell and you'll follow me there. There is nowhere, no dark place where you won't be with me. And I just, I remember the first time I really saw that in scripture. Um, It was a really hard day for me, really bad season of depression. And I was kind of going through the motions and doing what I thought I was supposed to do, you know, to be a good Christian. And I'd already been in leadership for years and, um, you know, I'd kind of still had this mentality that like you can kind of use scripture like magic words. Like you just kind of, if you say it over and over again, maybe it'll be true to your heart. Right. Um, and so I was, I was in like a, a staff prayer and I was reading through this verse and it just kind of like hit me. And I had this mental picture of myself like curled up, like in the fetal position, like, literally in the pit of hell and, you know, just kind of pictured Jesus just sitting there with me, like, okay, like I'll sit here with you as long as it takes. Right. Um, and I'll climb out with you. Like I'm with you on the journey. I'm with you on the long road. I'm with you in the dark places. And that to me is so much more powerful. And sometimes I think takes more faith to believe in that God than the magic wand God, who's just going to fix all the things for you. Well, I would say this is one of the challenges. You know, a lot of people are leaving, a lot of people leave the faith. And I think one of the reasons they leave the faith is because they were taught to expect you know, a continual mountaintop experience spiritually, Mm -hmm. or they were, you know, told that, okay, well, Jesus is going to fix all of these problems, A to Z. And the problem that Jesus fixes is your sin problem, obviously. And, um, and then, then walks with you, like you said, through all of the parts of your life on top of the mountain and then down deep in the recesses of hell. But, yeah. you know, you still may have financial problems. You still could get cancer. You still might get in a car accident or, um, you know, you still might deal with depression and anxiety. So when people, re- you know, they go, oh, wow, I was kind of sold something, you know, a bill of goods about this Jesus. Right. He didn't fix everything. But, but that's not anywhere really in the scripture. Right. You know, I mean, Jesus, says he'd come that your joy may be complete, but joy isn't necessarily happiness. It's a sense of contentment, whether things are good or bad. And I feel like in the church, it's time to sort of recognize, um, you know, do you think that we we fail to see some of the biblical characters as real people? I think so. You know, that they're, um, they're just these whitewashed, kind of very simple, one-dimensional figures, you know, David who conquered Goliath or, you know, Noah who built the ark, but you don't realize the great anguish that they go through so many times. Mm-hmm. Totally. So, so you mentioned your book and, um, and maybe this would be great because I'm very excited for you. We're very excited to hear that you've got this coming up. Can you tell us a little bit about the book and kind of, you know, maybe what, how, how it's going to be, what you're going to be saying or your ideas and then when it's coming out? Sure. Well, um, I sadly don't know when it's coming out. I'm actually in the process of pitching to publishers right now. So that is a very long process. Usually once a book deal is signed, it can take 18 to 24 months. So it could be, you know, 2021 
um, early 2022, hopefully not that long, if I wind up going the traditional publishing route. Um, but I'm, you know, working on a lot of the content through my blog and um, through speaking. So a lot of those ideas, you know, are going mm. to be out there in okay. the ether um, between now and then. But really what it is, is the book that I wish I had when I was a brand new baby Christian and was struggling with depression and wasn't sure why I was still having these problems and thought I was sinning. Mm. And when I had been a Christian for five years and didn't even really believe that God loved me yet because I couldn't be good enough and get rid of my struggles that I didn't even understand were an illness or when I had been a Christian for 10 years and had been in ministry and still dealt with these secret thoughts of suicide and self-harm. It's really just a handbook for those of faith who are struggling with mental illness, thoughts of suicide, anxiety, and for those who love them. So there's going to be a lot of my story in it because I think that, you know, the Bible says like we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And there's a lot of power in story And there's a lot of power in people knowing they're not alone, but it's not just going to be a memoir. It's going to be a lot of really practical things that people in the church aren't talking about. Like, how do you find a therapist? What do you watch out for when you're getting on medication? Um, How do you know if your therapist is a good fit? I had to see five before I found one good one, right. one good therapist. Right. N- nobody told me that. Nobody, you know, helped me set expectations that I'm hiring this person to help me. And um, data shows that one of the most important factors in whether or not therapy is successful is the therapeutic relationship. So if you don't have a good relationship where you can trust your therapist or your counselor, it's a waste of time and money. You've got to find someone that you can trust. Right, right. Um, you and know, it's hard to do that if you're, you know, if you're in a certain emotional state. It's also hard. Yes. To, it's also hard to do that. I love the fact that your book is going to be both practical and personal, because I think that's, you know, like I think one of the things, um, and maybe you're already planning to to put this in there, but you know, people who are not dealing with uh, depression or anxiety, they have mm-hmm. no idea what it's like, and then they don't have an idea of what to say or how to react. Totally. And I feel like, um, and that's true in a lot of uh, ways. I mean, you know, there are people, they don't know what to say if somebody loses, you know, um, you know, a loved one. They're like, what do I say? You know, sometimes you don't have to say anything, you know, but um, yeah. I, I love that. Now, in the meantime, um, you, I know you have so many great things that you've written. How can people find your writing, uh, go ahead and give us like your blog and other ways that people can interact with you. Sure. Um, my blog is beautiful between.com. Okay. And I actually, on that, um, no, you mentioning people don't know what to say. If you go to beautiful between.com slash what to say, oh, wow. um, there is a resource. It's a two page guide on what to say to someone struggling with depression or suicide. And, you know, the first page gives you some understanding and explains why you should talk to people certain ways and not other ways. And then the second page is just a list of statements. These are things that have been helpful that um, people have said to me, things that um, suicide prevention experts recommend, just really simple phrases that you can have in your back pocket. That's incredibly helpful. I hope so. Um, Yeah, I really hope so. That's that was my goal, because when I wrote my article, um, the the suicide article, I started getting so many responses from family members, from parents and spouses and kids who are saying, like, I don't know what to say. And so. um, Right. Well, yeah, and that's so it's half of the battle is is you know because I, I know we'll have people and and they are you know they're they're full of empathy and they want to do the right thing they literally are afraid to say the wrong thing so they say nothing. 
Right. And there's this idea that if you say the word suicide, that you're going to put it in somebody's head. Yeah. St- studies show that's not true. Right. Like you don't have to be worried that if you say like, hey, are you thinking about hurting yourself? That that's going to give them the idea. It's much more likely that they'd be like, oh, my gosh, no. Or like, yeah, like I didn't really want to say it, but yeah, I am. And then that opens up a dialogue so that you can help them get the help they need. Um, And there's, you know, there's some little hints in there as well. You don't have to have any answers at all. That's the most important thing you need to know is you don't have to know a thing. All you have to do is love the person and be willing to walk with them. Right. Um, there's tips in there. Like one of the things you can say is, um, you know, I don't know what to do, but we can figure it out together. Or can I help you make an appointment for a doctor? Things like that that are so small. Yeah. That are really, really big. I think that would be really helpful. I'll make sure to put a link to that in the show notes and also a link to your blog. And, um, Instagram, Twitter, can we reach you on those um, social media platforms as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my handle on Instagram and Twitter is at Sarah, S A R A H R B N S N. So it's Sarah and then my last name, Robinson, without the vowels. <laughs> There's probably a bunch of Sarah Robinsons out there. I there would imagine. are, surprisingly. <laughs> yeah. I'll link yeah. to that as well. Cool. Well, Sarah, I really appreciate um, talking with you, and I appreciate your um, openness on a difficult topic for a lot of people and, um, and, and just your honesty about it, and I hope that we can do this again soon. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed chatting with you. Well, that's all we have for the show today. Thanks again for listening to the podcast. If there's one thing that you can do to help me spread the truth of God's Word and help people connect better with God through the Scriptures, consider going onto iTunes or onto Spotify and leave a short five-star review. And also, if you would, share the podcast with a friend. Maybe you know somebody who needs a little bit of encouragement. Maybe somebody is also interested in learning more about the Bible. Tell them about the podcast, where they can find it. You can find it on iTunes, on the new podcast app. You can find it on Spotify. Uh, You can ask Alexa to play it. It's on TuneIn. Plenty of different places for you. Or just go to thebiblerevealed.org. Today's show was brought to you by The Bible Revealed, a ministry of Pass Media Group. The show was recorded at the Lost Dog Studio in Orlando, Florida, written, recorded, and mixed by me. Our producer is Dylan Kreienbrink. Thanks again for listening today. We'll see you next time on The Bible Revealed.